the clash of two cultures in uh, Genesis uh, 4 to 16. So where we left off last time, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was with uh, King. And uh, remember, he slays his brother Abel because of his jealousy over Abel's righteousness. And that God would even say later that uh, you can't really cover what you've done because Abel's blood still cries uh, from the ground to, uh, to the heavens. And we talked about the, how the way of Cain, uh, as we see it in the New Testament, was the, the way of uh, uh, self-reliance, uh, a way of you want to have an approach to God, but on your own terms and so forth. And there was a lot of things that we can learn. Now, we, we get the tail end of that here in, in verse 16 and go into his descendants. And with that, we see <clears throat> really the formation of a culture that advances tremendously in terms of technology, uh, in art, and, uh, and so forth. We're introduced to the first poetry that we find in the Bible in a song that goes with that culture. And we're going to find that that culture, the culture of Cain, is frightening uh, in, in its uh, likeness to the culture that we live in today. And then we're going to be introduced into the culture of Seth, who comes along because Adam and Eve are still trusting God to fulfill his promise of Genesis 3.15 to bring the seed, the Messiah, who would undo what's been done in terms of the fall of man. And we're going to find that somebody at some point is going to still continue on uh, in terms of calling on the name of God. So there's a contrast and there's really a clash that we live in today. And you hear that phrase all the time, don't you? There's a culture war that's going on. Some, some writers, uh, commentators, will, will use that expression. And it certainly uh, is, begins here in Genesis and we still live in it each and every day. I wanted to show a little video clip of, um, entitled, Are You a Traitor? Uh, and it means, have you traded uh, the culture that is out there that is prevalent in today's world that we're going to be studying about uh, for the culture and the values of what it really means to, to walk with God? So let's take a look at this clip. For the pilgrims, it was freedom of worship. For the founding fathers, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For the huddled masses, it was opportunity, equality, freedom. Today, it's more, much more. Today, the American dream means more money, more house, more car, more power, more fame, more stuff. Instant, on demand, drive through, microwavable, downloadable, 1,000 channels, 10,000 songs, happiness in the aisles of a mega store, fulfillment in four easy payments, purpose in a bank account, a barcode, a magnetic strip, more me, supersized, satisfied, and served. Self centered, self focused. That's the new American dream. So, what is a trader? Traders have seen the puppet strings. They've glimpsed the chronic disappointment behind the glittering curtain of greed and consumerism. Traders sense that the road to success may not end as advertised. Traders see through the empty promises and greedy deception of the marketing machine. Traders know that as they lay dying, they won't be wishing for shinier toys, more square footage, a better title on their business card. Traders don't need more stuff to make them happy. They are owned by material things. Traders understand that there is a bigger world. They've seen the face of need, of want, of disease, of hopelessness. They can't turn away anymore. They can't hide in front of the TV. They can't work, play, or party harder to block it out. They can't ignore it anymore. Traders want to make a difference. Traders have to make a difference. Traders have resources, time, money, ideas, skills, creativity, passion. Traders realize that God gave them these resources for a reason, to pick up their cross and follow Christ, to be the good Samaritan, to obey the Great Commission. A trader looks for a place to help, maybe next door, maybe across town, maybe on the other side of the world. A trader trades in one night a week to help the homeless. A trader trades in summer vacation to train graphic designers in Central Asia. A trader trades in the pursuit of the American dream for a world that desperately needs Christ. Are you a trader? the values of this world and this world system for those of Christ and the clash that uh, that we see around us today really begins right here in uh, in Genesis. Let's take a look at verse 16 to 18. Cain would 
as we said from our last study, would continue in his rebellion. Then Cain went out of the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built the city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, to Irad was born uh, Mehuhael, and Mehuhael begot Methuselah, Methuselah begot Lamech. So uh, Cain continued to buy in the rebellion by rebuilding the city. Now remember the Lord had said because he's killed his brother and uh, he'd already warned them, you know, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you, but you must master it. But Cain would not heed that caution from God. He goes ahead and he kills his brother, premeditated murder because he's mad at God and he's jealous of the righteousness that uh, is attributed to Abel because he's brought a proper sacrifice. Uh, and therefore, he's judged by God, even in that God, in his grace, places a, a mark upon him so there would not be undue vengeance uh, upon him because now he, the killer, is afraid of being killed himself. Uh, he goes out and God says, you shall wander your entire life. That is the penalty that I've placed upon you. That is my will for your life at this point. And Cain says, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I think I'm just going to go right here and build a city. I'm just going to stay right here. I'm not going to wander anywhere. I'm not going to do anything God wants me to. So this is a, a city that's being built. And again, there's these technological advances we're going to read about it. But they're all, it, it's kind of an in-your-face God. It's uh, you know, totally in defiance. One writer, as Warren Wordsby said, that um, of Cain, he had no need for a religion of blood. Because, uh, and again, if we know the Lord, we understand the, the statement that, he wanted to come to God in his own terms, and there's a lot of people that are still like that. In his case, he would not bring the sacrifice God required. There are people today that want a religious life. They want to be people of faith. They want to have some hope for their life. They want something to trust in, but they don't want to accept the fact that it was necessary for Jesus Christ to die on a cross for their sins. They want to be able to relieve their conscience of guilt and so forth that they feel over decisions they've made, things that's happened to them. And God wants to meet them and minister to them and have them have a clear conscience and their sins forgiven and the true hope of heaven. But often they've rejected that. They don't mind the teachings of Jesus that he healed people, he fed the poor, he was a kind man. We like him as the rabbinical teacher who taught on the mountainside to love one another, but we just don't want to hear about the fact that it was necessary for him to die because of my sins, and that the only way that I can have true forgiveness and eternal life is by placing my faith in him. And you've got friends and family that probably fall into this religion of Cain. It's okay to a degree to talk about Jesus, just don't tell me I'm a sinner and need my sins forgiven. So again, the culture and the religion of the culture is still with us. Uh, the question always comes up, just more trivia than theological, where did Cain get his wife? And uh, that is answered in the following chapter in verse 4. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons, plural, and daughters, plural. Uh, at this point in time, it's been about uh, 130 years have passed in Adam's life, and uh, we're just kind of figuring he had a couple of kids along the way in 130 years, even if he had just like one every decade. Well, honey, that little baby was a lot of work. Let's wait about 10 years for the next one. But uh, uh, anyway, there was a, Cain ends up marrying one of his sisters that uh, ends up not being an, uh, an issue in terms of the degenerative effect of genetics because, again, they were so fresh from uh, the hand of God and what sin does when that takes place uh, in today's world uh, was not uh, apparent in their lives. And that does become an issue in the Mosaic law. By then, enough time had passed that uh, God says to Moses, make it in your law that you cannot marry a close relative uh, because of the uh, uh, ill mental as well as physical effects that it would have. It's interesting that uh, the Muslims do not follow that and they've become, it's become a real issue for them read an article not that long ago of the high rate of mental illness and, and some of the other birth defects that you would expect because in Muslim countries 
uh, they very often will, cousin Mary's cousin is very common, very common, and that's been going on for hundreds of years now, uh, and uh, it is a, a real problem, a real issue for them. But not so much uh, in this stage of, uh, of mankind and his development. Now, Cain City, again, uh, at the time of Enoch's birth, was in defiance. It was in, again, an attempt to override what God had said about him being a wanderer. Uh, basically, he says he's not going to do that. The last half of verse 17 says, And he built the city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. The name means dedication or consecration or initiation. Uh, and it's a new beginning for Cain at the birth of his son, the naming of the city. But it's still a new beginning without God. Secondly, the descendants of Cain advance in their own civilization. That's in verses 19 to 24. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah. The name of the second was Zilah. And Adah bore Jabal. And his father, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zilah, she also bore Tubal Cain an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and in iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Uh, so, the first thing we note about this civilization, again, advancing the technology, but uh, moving away from the, uh, the Lord is the uh, indicated here because it includes polygamy. Only five generations from, uh, from Adam upon whom God said, <coughs> you shall leave father and mother and be united to your one wife <laughs> and become one, uh, one flesh. Uh, that was God's design. Jesus in Matthew 19:8 when he's uh, dealing with the divorce issue with uh, the Pharisees of his day, says, as you've heard from the beginning, and he makes a reference back to the original creation account, here's God's design for marriage, one man, one woman. It's a very short period of time. Again, these are the descendants of Cain who are living in defiance, away and against God, and we see it indicated in terms of their polygamy. So already we have an attack on marriage. And again, as we go through this, you're going to see some, I hope you see some frightening similarities uh, of our own culture. But that's certainly one of the, uh, one of the first, although in Genesis 2.24, we have the pronouncement of God of his intent for, uh, for marriage. So a civilization, a civilization well advanced, but well advanced in its rebellion against God as well. Secondly, the civilization included cultural advances that I've mentioned and evaluated from a human standpoint, you would be pretty uh, amazed uh, at uh, some of the things that they were able to accomplish. They were able to build a, a city. And, uh, uh, and again, it's important to note that uh, uh, God doesn't even try to reform the Canaanites at this point. Uh, instead, we're going to see Seth be born and through him try to raise up a, a godly line because things are degrading so quickly of course, it's only a few generations, and we'll look at that in a couple of weeks before it's so bad, there's only one family left that calls on the name of the Lord, the family of Noah, and God has to destroy all of mankind, which was, uh, uh, if you kind of do the, the math on this and the length of life and so forth, it wasn't, it wasn't a small population. We're talking in the billions, and, uh, and already God brings judgment to the earth. Things are getting bad very quickly after the fall. And again, this is not a pronouncement against culture and arts and literature and, and uh, technological development, uh, but it is against what's behind it, which is saying, I don't need God. I can, uh, I can survive on my own. I don't need a dependence on him. I can just pull myself up by my bootstraps. After all, I am the captain of my fate, and, uh, and I can be a self-determinate being and so forth. And... Um, and certainly, um, there's only a little bit of that reflected in our <laughs> movies uh, in the music of, of today. In fact, that's what a lot of it's all about. But uh, notice Adah's two sons uh, by Lamech. One excelled Jabal. He was the founder of the science of agriculture. 
Jubal founded, uh, again, the, uh, culturally, uh, the study of music and uh, instruments, building instruments. And then we're introduced to a third son, very interesting, Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So he's the uh, ancestor, in a sense, of technology and uh, industry. And uh, however primitive his work might have been, his name means hammer or sharpen, uh, and no doubt included not just farming equipment and so forth, but probably weapons as well. And we're going to see that in the song that uh, is sung uh, here in, in a moment. But uh, uh, again, notice his name. You've got uh, Jabal, Jubal, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal. That must have been just like a little confusing. No, mom told you. No, I, she said you. No, 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 she said you. I mean, with the, the names among the kids. And it could have been left at that, but they don't. This last kid, they throw on the, the cane. We'd like to name you after your murderous grandfather because he and so defiant of, that's what they do. Well, who are you named after? Oh, my grandfather killed his brother. Really famous for that. Cold blood, yeah. And then uh, didn't, no remorse or anything. Yeah, just kind of told God right to his face. I don't give a rip. Yeah, that's who I'm named after. How about you? Uh, so the fact that, um, anybody find this a little unusual, that they would tag this kid with this name? Uh, and most writers and commentators believe that there's a lot more to it. The other kids have these very similar names. They all three could have had very similar names. Uh, but instead, they throw on uh, the added dimension to his name, which uh, implies uh, the idea of a dark side of the technology that he's not just simply making farming equipment, but there are weapons uh, in involved as well. However, uh, civilization advances. There's always the potential for, uh, for evil. It would be hard to imagine a life without uh, drugs, as in painkillers and uh, pharmaceutical things that help us and heal us and so forth. Obviously, uh, we're not real thrilled about the epidemic of ice that's uh, uh, right here in the Hawaiian Islands, one of the worst places for it in the country. We're also thrilled about the, the gift of new music and the writing of the Psalms and being able to worship the Lord, and we appreciate musical talent and so forth. But certainly we, we live in a day where it's, uh, it's often used to, uh, for not anything in terms of edification, but the promotion even of violence and sexuality and so forth. Uh, Nazi Germany boasted that they, uh, had, uh, they were the repository of high art and a leader in technology, which they were. But there's certainly, you can see that there's nothing wonderful about the advancement of these things if there's nothing redemptive in them. Uh, and that all of these things can turn very evil very, uh, very quickly. There was, a, there was a reason that the Russians moved in quickly and captured all of the German scientists, and that's the reason they were able to get their satellites up in orbit first and so forth, uh, because the Germans had brilliance in terms of engineering and technology. So again, the mention of technology development early on presents also a problem for the evolutionists who would again would see the early man or ancient man as the guy that uh, has trouble ordering his insurance online in less than 15 minutes, the caveman. And, uh, uh, and yet we see uh, something very different from that, from Genesis. We see uh, an advancement in terms of technology right away. And that's what we find out when the archaeologists go out and begin to discover what was ancient man really like. Just a couple of examples. In terms of the use of metals and materials near Mount Ararat, Russian scientists have found over 500 furnaces used for smelting bronze, copper, zinc, tin, and arsenic. Again, this is by ancient man. Weapons from around the world are found to be electroplated, which is uh, not only a chemical process, but it's also an electronic process. And um, <clears throat> somebody gave me a little uh, electroplating setup one time when I was still doing glasswork, and it's like, don't think I can figure this out on my own. Uh, everything on these bottles say danger, and then I've got this electronic equipment. Uh, no, thank you. I'll uh, just pay somebody else to do that. But it's, uh, it's a highly uh, technical skill, but ancient man had it. Uh, and again, museums around the world that have, uh, can show from 
uh, ancient man, they, they had batteries and electricity. Bell buckles in China have been found to contain 5% magnesium, 10% copper, and 85% aluminum. Not an easy feat in terms of the combination of, of, of metals. Swords in China dating back 2,200 years have been found using a combination of different metals as, uh, as well. And we've uh, visited some of the museums in China, and it's astounding some of the things that they were accomplished uh, uh, thousands of years ago. Travel in the ancient world, people from Mesopotamia traveled to America 2,000 years before Columbus. We found maps of the Antarctica dating back to the 1500s that only recently we were able to do ourselves. Other discoveries in the ancient world included uh, drugs like penicillin that have been found in uh, Egypt. And of course, there's the buildings and the monuments around the world that we are unable to recreate today because we do not have the technical skill to be able to do it. But they were just cavemen. <laughs> That's why when the, these TV shows uh, talk about some of these things, it's always mysteries of the ancient man. Why is it a mystery? It's only a mystery if you think they were all idiots. If you realize what they were in terms of who God created them to be uh, and uh, the brilliance that they had and the technological abilities that they had very early on, it's really not a mystery. Uh, and we see early on in Genesis this growth in technology, which could have been a good thing, but in this case, uh, it's all in defiance of God. And the civilization also had its own song. And uh, we mentioned it in verse 23. Then Lamech said to his wives, again, the first poetry that we have in the Bible, Ada and Zila, hear my voice. I'm sure his wives were thrilled to hear him sing this. And I'm pretty sure that he had a couple of bob wire tattoos around his biceps, and this was actually done to a rap. But I'm not going to attempt it. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Four things about this song. One is the obvious. It's a song in defiance of, uh, of God. Uh, Lamech is saying that he's uh, wounded, and uh, the term for young man can also be translated child. So he's saying, I had a young man, like a child, wound me. I killed him. I like to sing a song about that. Good thing they don't do that anymore. You know, that, that violent stuff in, in musical lyrics. I'm glad they've done away with it. No, I think that's on the rise, actually. But uh, uh, again, he's giving this speech or this song to his two wives, bragging and boasting about killing a young man or even possibly a child uh, because he was wounded, he kills him. Uh, there's no mention of a sword here, but the song is traditionally called the Song of the Sword. Uh, and again, Ada and Zila have to sit there suffering the humiliation of polygamy and now listening to their boastful husband uh, who is, uh, has no remorse at all at killing somebody that's very young uh, simply because he's been wounded in some way. The song also, uh, as we've already pointed out, celebrates violence. The song of the sword glorifies it, for I have killed a young man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. So when a civilization becomes completely self-defiant uh, and away from God, and they become completely self-centered in and of themselves, two things emerge very, very quickly. One is there a devaluing of human life, and there's a devaluing of traditional marriage. Are we there yet? I think this is right, right where we are. Uh, any, uh, what are the icons or the hallmarks of, of this civilization? Well, violent icons, violent music, and violent streets to go along with it. <laughs> I'm amazed at the stuff that people wear on t-shirts and put stickers on their car that just speak of blatant sexuality and blatant violence and stuff. It's, uh, uh, it's really amazing. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it just wouldn't have been there a generation ago. Now, we talk about the class of civilization, and there's a, war, a culture war that's going on out there. And I've uh, mentioned it before, but again, the, the typical, the mores of a uh, culture or society, what they value as good versus evil, what they honor versus what they dishonor, and those kinds of things, things that generally people hold together in a culture, regardless of their religious affiliation and so forth, those things uh, typically over culture, over history, change typically a generation to a generation. 
uh, the generation before me probably had slightly different values than I have. The generation after me would have slightly different values. And that's the way things progressed historically. That all changed in the late 1960s and the early 70s. And since then, sociologists tell us, the mores of our culture here in the United States have changed every 10 years. So instead of changing every 70 years, we shrunk it down to 10 years. And, uh, and obviously, things aren't getting <laughs> better. It might be a really great thing if things were getting more godly or more righteous, but they're actually going the other way. And apparently, it's a very, uh, a very steep downhill slide that we've been on in the empirical evidences of the 20th century, despite its <clears throat> masses, uh, advances in technology, has actually uh, continued to be the most barbarous or murderous or violent century uh, more so than all the others combined that we at least have historical records of, and we're well on our way to continue in the 21st century. So we, we find some very interesting similarities here between the, not Canaanites, but the Canaanites and their culture and the ones that we live in as well. The third thing is the song glorifies vengeance. Uh, the last stanza there, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. So he kills uh, his brother. Cain uh, is in defiance about that. Uh, a couple of generations later, Lamech's already got the number one hit song about it uh, that everybody's singing. Uh, and it has everything to do not just with violence and making his two wives listen to it and the polygamy and the devaluing of life, but vengeance is, is a big part of this whole thing. And it's a glorification of, uh, of vengeance. Very interesting. Uh, around the world, one of the things that we see where there's never been a penetration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the introduction of the concepts of grace and forgiveness, you have vengeance is a very big deal. Uh, and therefore, you've got places where it, it, it's difficult for us uh, as the United States to intervene because you've got people that have been fighting each other for a thousand years. And, and we can come to some... Uh, some ceasing or cessation of violence for a period of time. But finally, these guys over here go, I remember they killed my grandparents, and they let's get, and then it starts again. And then maybe they're, they're victorious, and now these guys, you know, two generations later, well, I know, and they did, let's get, you know, and then it's just kind of back and forth. Because nobody ever actually forgives. And one of the great testimonies to the, our country and the fact that it was founded upon Christians and Christian principles is that there is the concept of grace and forgiveness that really penetrates, thankfully, throughout our culture, though certainly we're losing it quickly. That's why when after World War II, we could pour money and time and energy effort into Germany and help them rebuild, completely forgive them for what they had done and so forth, uh, and become an ally with them, as we've done with, uh, with Japan, who, uh, again, boy, I just... Uh, uh, I've just finished reading a, a great read, if you like uh, World War II stuff, the story of Louis Zamfini, who was a uh, great Olympic runner and then went in the Army Air Corps, was a bombardier, and uh, was, um, uh, went down over the Pacific. I don't want to tell you the whole story, but uh, <clears throat> he and one other guy set the record for being stranded at sea over 50 days, and they survive. Uh, unbelievable stuff that goes on and how they survive only to wash up on an island occupied by the Japanese. And then that was the good life on the raft. Uh, it gets horrific a after that, but uh, survives the whole thing and comes to faith in Jesus Christ during the, uh, the process uh, of it. And, uh, <clears throat> but to live what they went through, men like that, and then to completely forgive and uh, pour into uh, Japan and help them rebuild their economy and their country and so forth. That's because of grace. That's because of forgiveness. And that's not because we're a country or a culture that esteems vengeance. But this culture does. And it's changing a little bit. And it's still out there around the world. Now, this leads to the fourth part of this song. It is very interesting. It is a song that is referred to by Jesus himself. Peter comes to Jesus one day, and uh, Peter has been being taught by Jesus about the importance of forgiveness and grace. <clears throat> and in Matthew 18, 21, he's kind of almost bragging. Then Peter came to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? 
up to seven times. I'm sure Peter at this point thought he would, Jesus would be very impressed with him. This guy's going to sin against me, the same sin seven times, Lord. I'm going to forgive him anyway. I bet you're really proud of me, aren't you, Jesus? And of course, then Jesus makes a direct reference to the song of Lamech, in verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, or sevenfold. Jesus says, in the same way that the culture of Lamech says, you should reap vengeance and have anger in your heart against anyone that's ever done anything wrong to you in that degree. If you're a follower of me, you will forgive others. Uh, so it's, it's really an incredible, incredible statement that, uh, that Jesus comes along and says, uh, there is another way. And, there's, uh, and we don't have to go along with the culture and the culture of vengeance, the culture of violence, uh, and so forth that's around us, that if we're going to follow him, we should so show the same degree of forgiveness that they would show in terms of vengeance. So very interesting, this song, the first poetry we have, it tells us a lot about the culture, what was going on, and of course the answer of Jesus to living in a culture like that. And certainly we need the is that easier said than done? Just keep forgiving and forgiving? I thought Peter's saying was pretty good seven times in a day. But to have unlimited forgiveness, man, we need the grace of God. We need the Lord to work in our lives. We're going to have to try to make sure we give every bit of anger and bitterness to the Lord constantly, not allow that root of bitterness. Uh, again, Hebrews says, uh, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root uh, grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Because that anger and that bitterness is like a root. It's like a taproot. Pretty sure it's like a holocaust. If you've ever tried to dig one of those things out of your yard, uh, you've got to go deep to get those things out. And that's the way bitterness is. It can affect our relationships so much. On a personal level, it's so important. It's great to think about it on a national level and what it does to a culture, but uh, so important that we apply it. Uh, and we need the, the grace and the help of God to do that. But two cultures that are uh, really contrasted here. Let's go into the third part where there's some hope in all this. The descendants of Seth advance the character of God. That's in verse 25 to 26. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born. And he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So God's character is advanced in the naming of a, of a son. Uh, Adam and Eve and are still believing, trusting the promises of God. They're hanging on to Genesis uh, 3.15. Uh, and they were believing that uh, as we uh, looked at the, the text, when, when Cain is born, that he's the seed. God said that through your seed, a particular, a male child will come, and through him, uh, Satan, who has brought this upon mankind and, and deceived Eve, and Adam goes along with it, that uh, he's going to make an attempt to, to strike out at this seed, the Messiah. He will only be able to bruise his heel. He'll inflict some injury, but he will be destroyed in the process, and certainly that's what took place on the cross and Adam and Eve are hanging on to this promise. It didn't happen with Cain. And man, that had to be disappointing to see him kill their other son. Now they have neither one of those children. Some time goes by, and now Seth is born, and she's still believing the promise. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful thing. Seth means uh, granted. She's saying, God has granted me another child. And she's attributing the birth of her child to the grace of God, again, another offspring, or literally, as we have it here in a New King James, another seed, a direct reference to the promise of Genesis 3.15, uh, and again, echoed by Paul uh, in Galatians chapter 3 as well. Uh, the second thing about the, this uh, advancing of God's character, it's in the birth of the next uh, son. Seth has a son. He names him Enosh, or we say sometimes Enosh, uh, because then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Now notice it's the capital L-O-R-D. It's the covenant name of God. We might say Yahweh 
They're remembering that God uh, not only is the creator, but he's the redeemer and wants to have a relationship with them, and that's what they're calling on. Kenneth Matthews uh, has said that Cain's firstborn and successor pioneered cities and civilized arts, but Seth's firstborn and successors pioneered worship. And, uh, and there's, there's where the contrast is. Uh, there's nothing wrong with technological developments and the culture and the arts and so forth. And, uh, and all of it can be used to, to, uh, to glorify God. Uh, but uh, these guys are focused on, on worship, on calling on the name of the Lord. And again, this is Moses writing to call upon. We would find as we continue to read, regular means to be proclaiming. So they're proclaiming about the character and about the, the nature of God. And uh, they're worshipers of God. And, uh, and we will find that throughout the writings of Moses. And we're introduced to, finally, to Noah, who is a, a, a worshiper of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and eventually to Moses when things are formalized under that covenant. But before the Abrahamic covenant, before the law, before the Davidic covenant, God's people were known for those that proclaim the name of the Lord. That means they're, they're telling him how great and glorious he is. Remember the first temptation with the Eve in the garden was all about God is not good and God wants to deceive you. God doesn't want to have your best interest in mind. Uh, and they counteract that by reminding themselves constantly as they worship that God is good and God is merciful and he is righteous and he does have my best interest in uh, in mind, and I can trust him, and I can surrender my life to him. And they remind themselves of that in worship, and they tell it to other people on a, re on a regular basis. And God's really called us all to do the same thing. We're in a culture that's going the other way. There's still the contrast, and there's a tremendous clash. But, you know, the same, the same things that brought you to faith in Jesus Christ, to have your sins forgiven, to have a God that would put your life back together, that would give you some kind of future and some kind of hope. Everybody's got those same needs and those same desires. Some people are very blinded to it. Some people have gone, you know, uh, another way, but that we need to be people, the people of God that historically have proclaimed the name of the Lord. So here are two... two uh, two cultures clashing against each other. And it's amazing how we're going to see in a very quick, quick time the descendants of Seth, even though men begin to call upon the name and proclaim in the name of the Lord, it, <laughs> it gets whittled down in about uh, another five generations very quickly of the world all the way down to one family. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty frightening. And what happens when that one culture prevails in a self-reliant, self uh, self-defiant and against God. God comes and judges them through the flood. And, uh, and certainly it, it would look and appear that uh, as the world turns against God and away from him, that uh, it's pretty ripe for God's judgment again. The promise to Noah, of course, with the rainbow, the sign of the Noahic covenant was God would not judge the world by water again. Peter tells us, no, it's going to be a little different the next time. It's going to be by fire. And we have the details of it in the book of Revelation, a horrifying time on planet Earth. And it just seems like we're, we're headed very quickly for that time. But we still have the ability, and praise God, we live in a country where we have the freedom to be able to proclaim the, the name of the Lord. It's all changing very rapidly. I just read early this morning about a, um, uh, one of our ambassadors who is being recalled by the current uh, uh, administration because he wrote and spoke too much about his faith in the abortion issue. Can't do <laughs> And when, when they interviewed, so he's being recalled and uh, losing his job o over that. And uh, he's, he said that, uh, I don't think one can call, talk about their faith and the issues of life too much. <laughs> so he's losing his job over it. And, uh, and that's just the culture where there's a clash of what's, what's going on, what's acceptable to even be spoken about in the public arena. But right now, uh, we pray for, uh, uh, for the immediate future that uh, because young men and young women will swear an oath and put on a uniform and defend our freedoms, we get to do what we're doing this morning, worship God openly, study his word, and, and proclaim his name uh, in this country while we have an opportunity. There's a clash. There, there's two different uh, cultures out there. 
And uh, like that video clip says, are you willing to be a traitor? Because there, there's cultural values that are all about materialism. Uh, and there's another set of values that are all about God's kingdom and things that are going to count for all time and eternity. And we really, if we've made a commitment to Jesus Christ to pick up our cross and follow him, it's something that uh, Luke tells us we need to do on a daily basis. We have to make that decision. Because we do live in the culture that has different values than ours. And it is making every day an attempt to influence us. Remember what Paul said in Romans 12. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, a Canaanite cultural world. But be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind. That you might test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. And I love the J.B. Phillips translation of that where he says, don't let the world press you into its mold. So every, everything that you see in terms of the media, uh, things that you hear, there's tremendous influences out there that will attempt you to press you into its mold. But we have to be transformed from it by the renewing of our mind that we might think through. That's why we study God's word, to renew our minds, why we're open to the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. Because we all want to know God's will. If, you, if, you, if we had a, a, a Christian conference and we we're going to have 10 different workshops and one of them was how to know God's will. There's going to be more people in that one than any of the other ones. I don't care what the other speakers are or what the topics are. We all want to know God's will. And Paul tells us very clearly, don't be conformed to a Canaanite type influence over your life, but be transformed by God's word and the work of your Holy Spirit. You surrender your life to the Lord, Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God will show you and reveal his will to you that we might walk in it and know it. And I, you know, that's the ultimate thing. That is the ultimate uh, life. That's where we want to be. We can be used to transform our culture. It's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen.